What's going on, y'all? Today, we're going to talk about negotiating with venues. How do you find a venue when you're first starting out? So in last week's video, we talked about how to get started promoting shows by promoting local bands or local band shows. So now when you're reaching out to venues as an outside promoter and you're trying to find a venue to do shows in, again, doing it very systematically, right, step by step, the goal should be to start focusing on these smaller venues first. So 100 to 400 capacity. Um, you don't really want to jump into the bigger rooms yet when you're first starting out as a promoter. So get your reps in the smaller rooms, booking local shows there, booking national talent in those smaller rooms. So last week on the video, uh, Sh Shannon left a comment. So thank you, Shannon, for, for that comment. But any tips on negotiating with venues? And she had a part two to that question, which I didn't answer my post yet. Um, but she asked any tips on negotiating with venues, right? So here are a couple quick tips on knowing what to negotiate for when working with a venue. So for starters, you have to understand what venues are looking for, right? So what do venues want? Uh, venues want people in their venue, right? So pretty straightforward. They want shows, they're going to bring people out. They're also going to want ideally people that are drinking, right? So if you have 200 people, so in a 400 cap room, let's say you have 200 people that are spending $20 a head on the bar, that's $4,000, right? If And then if you have a sold out show with 400 people, but they're only spending $2 a head at the bar, that's $800, right? So the sold out show is not always the better show. It all really depends for the, the venue, the bar, um, how much the audience drinks. So it's almost like that we joke around, we say we're in the business of selling beers and not selling tickets, right? But so knowing that up front gives you a little bit of negotiating power, a little bit of prep for negotiating with, with venues. So first of all, um, some venues will do what's called a bar guarantee, right? So keeping the topic on the bar for a second for the first two points. Uh, I always say never do bar guarantees unless the venue is willing to give you a cut from the bar. Otherwise, tickets and bars are separate. You worry about the bar. We worry about the tickets, right? Um, so yeah, and a common percentage for bar guarantees between 10 and 15 percent that's pretty common so in your most ideal scenario as a promoter you want to pay no rent you want a percentage from the bar and you want to be able to sell your own tickets on your own ticketing platform right that's most ideal scenario as a promoter most ideal scenario for the venue is to charge you a rental fee uh give you a bar guarantee and um and manage your own tickets and i guess i didn't cover this yet what is a bar guarantee? So a bar guarantee is when you do a show at a venue, you have to guarantee them that they're going to make X amount at a bar, right? So let's say you're at a 200 cap room, you have to guarantee them they're going to get $2,000 at the bar. So the danger here as a promoter is if the bar only makes 1000 and the bar guarantee is 2000 you now owe the venue $1,000. And some venues will give, make you give them a deposit against the bar guarantee. And then once the guarantee, bar guarantee is met, you will get that deposit back, right? And there's a lot of things to keep track of. Like, are they keeping an accurate track of numbers and all of those things? So bar guarantees add a lot of complexity to the show and a lot more uh, trust and I guess honesty that, that goes along with the show as well. Then number two, if you have a bar guarantees, know your genres, know which genres drink the most at, at the bar. And just because you're you're the guy at the hip hop show that spends $40 doesn't mean that's the average at a uh, a, a hip hop fan spends at a bar, right? Or if you're the, the the reggae fan that only drinks one drink, doesn't mean that four or five dollars is the average per person at a at a reggae show, right? So the best way to learn this is is reps, right? And of course, things change over time. I, I have some numbers to, to share with you guys um, based on my history and my experience, but the the genres that classically do the best at the bar. Um, our, our country music, right? So country music in the past, I've done anywhere from 15 to $20 per person or even higher, right? So if you have a hundred people and you're hitting that $20 number, um, that's $2,000 at the bar, right? That's a really, really great number. Imagine 10,000 people, right? And, and, and more, and you start offering food. Of course, that number jumps up. That $20 per head person now is a $30 per head person if you have food involved. But uh, country music tends to do the best at, at the bar on, on average. Uh, and depends also on the type of country, right? If it's like very mainstream bubblegum country, probably not as well. If it's like a, a Sturgill Simpson or Chris Stapleton, uh, anything in that kind of realm uh, really, does really, really, really well at, at the bar, right? Um, next, I would categorize reggae, jam bands, funk, some EDM artists. EDM artists are targeted towards that older jam crowd right so if you look at i know that some people hate the, the term jam band but i know a lot of genres get categorized under that like 
funk, soul, reggae, uh, anything that blends other genres together, right? And they're at these jam festivals. And sometimes those jam festivals also have EDM artists, uh, artists like uh, Rufus the Soul that are targeted kind of more towards that crowd. And those bars tend to make 12 to $18 per head. And then we'll talk about budgeting in a second, but then classic metal, hard rock, stoner metal uh, tends to make between eight and fifteen dollars a head at the bar. Mainstream hip hop, EDM, and Latin shows are surprise, surprise, lower than most people think, between eight and twelve dollars per head at the bar, unless you have bottle service. If you have bottle service at, at a venue and you're doing these types of shows, then you can definitely budget fifteen to twenty a head at the bar. Um, Indie rock shows, folk and singer songwriters average reads you around six to ten ahead at the bar. Pop, EDM, R&B, comedy, Christian, K-pop, four to eight dollars ahead at the bar. And then uh, kids shows, uh, these wellness shows, where there's not a lot of like people in the wellness space that are touring now. Uh, jazz tends to be classic jazz tends to be in about the dollar to four dollars per head at the range, a range at the bar. And those are not exact numbers. Don't use these these numbers as um, ideal scenarios. What I would use these numbers for is for budgeting purposes, right? When you're budgeting and you're forecasting your show, and we can talk about that in a future video, you want to err on the low side, right? You want to almost estimate your revenue lower and your expenses higher. And what a lot of people will call that in, in the Live Nation and ages of the world, they call that sandbagging. So I was a classic sandbagger bagger that would budget revenue low, expenses high. And if I can still make a profit at that, then usually that was a good uh, forecast, right? And that really usually sets you up for, for a winning show. Um, so that's what these numbers are good for. It's for forecasting. They're not um, exact. They're not law. Like doesn't mean that you're, when you do a country show, you're getting $20 ahead at the bar. It all depends. Uh, and, and you'll fine tune your forecasting and budgeting with reps. The more you do this, the more you do shows, especially if you own a venue. Now let's talk about expenses. What expenses can you expect to pay at a venue as an outside promoter? The key ones are production, security, box office, or a ticket, you know, ticket person, they might call it a door person. Um, those are your three main ones, especially you when know, we're talking mostly in the 400 cap and lower space. Other expenses you could see is cleaning, uh, and venue rental fees, right? And then what would you expect to pay for production security, box office, cleaning, venue rental? Um, production, I know in the past, sound engineers and haven't paid a flat $100 fee that I'm starting to see that go number go up, which is great for the engineers because they are doing one of the most important jobs right at the show. So I would budget about 150 to 250 per engineer. Most clubs are gonna just have one person and they're gonna be in charge of lighting and audio, or they might just throw up a look on lighting, right? And then just manage audio, because most of them are audio engineers. And then some venues will have a lot a lighting designer and an audio engineer. And again, those are about 125 to 150 a head. So max, you're spending about 200 to $300 on, on production. Next is your security. Now with higher minimum wage co wages coming, um, you know, $15 a, uh, an hour, I would budget those at $15 an hour. Um, and just, Budget your event for security to come in an hour before doors until an hour after a uh, show ends. So let's say you have doors at seven, your show ends at 11. That's a four hour window, right? So I would budget six hours for your security per guard. Um, if you're kind of just running some numbers on your, on your own and you don't have a lot of details from the venue, I would, uh, I would error on the safe side, always err on safety when it comes to security. Do not cut corners on security. You want to keep your audience safe, your artist safe, yourself safe, right? The staff safe. Safety is the highest importance when doing shows. You don't want anything to happen at your shows. Don't end up in the news. Um, so you want to guard at the front door, at least one. You want to guard at the back door. You want a guard to where um, your dressing rooms are. You want a guard around stage and you want a guard to be able to float. I know five sounds like a lot, but when you're doing shows, you should budget for five at minimum. I've seen plenty of clubs that might do one guard or two, but as long as you've budgeted for five and you still budget a profitable show, then, then you're good, right? And if you're budgeting five guards, we said it was a six, six hours, right? So six times 15, that's... 90 bucks. Um, so about $400, $500 for security um, on the high end, right? It's probably going to be much, much lower on that for most smaller clubs. Um, but if you can still budget a profitable show at that, then, then you know you're going to you have everything covered and maybe you make even more than what you budgeted for. Um, for box office, same thing. Budget $15 an hour. Budget for your box office person to come in 
um, an hour before doors to set up guest lists and all those things until the show ends. So five hours, maybe at $15 an hour for your box house person. Cleaning, most of the times you can, the smaller clubs, you don't have to pay that. Venue rentals, a lot of times in the smaller clubs, you don't have to pay that. Uh, a good rule of thumb, whatever your capacity is times two, uh, maybe 250 after a, a post COVID world, but, um, or maybe three at the max. Um, that's the max you should pay for a venue, right? So if it's 200 capacity times two or three, four to 600 bucks is the most you should pay for a 200 cap room. Uh, if it's anything more than that, run the other way. It's really, really hard to make money on shows, right? Unless you have other revenue streams, unless you're getting a cut from the bar or anywhere else. Um, I've, I've once worked with a venue in, in Jacksonville, Florida that wanted to charge a thousand dollars for a 200 cap room. And I said, no way. Like I just, I just ran the other way. It's like, no, there's no way to make money at, at that rate, right? And sometimes that's just a sign that those venues are doing their own shows and they're just not interested in working with outside promoters or they already have a handful of outside promoters. That's like their go-to promoters and they are just not interested in adding new ones. Uh, and, that's, and that's cool. Um, number four, uh, a couple more tips. Get everything in writing and be very organized. Be very professional, right? Um, just set yourself up to look as someone that's organized, someone that has has their shit together, someone that is literally trying to build a real business. It doesn't, you don't have to do contracts and be the super legal person and be super official because it's going to scare some people off, but at least have it in writing, have an email that just summarizes everything, what you talked about with the club owner and the venue owner and what the deal is going to look like. So be organized. Uh, next, you want to uh, try to control ticketing if you're a promoter, right? So if you're just starting out, like we talked about last week, you're doing local shows, there's not a lot of advanced ticketing going on, like you're still selling tickets in advance online, because uh, most of those tickets will be sold uh, physically by, by the local bands, but still setting a ticket deal in place will help you, right? So set it up early. So if you promote a couple of local shows and you think that's something you wanted to keep doing, and last week we talked about doing 10 to 20 local shows to get those reps in, um, if you have a ticket deal in place, one, you can print tickets now for your local bands. Um, and two, now you're starting to build a track record. Now you're building stats and data with your ticketing company of how many tickets you can sell. And the reason that's important because some ticketing companies will give you an advance or a signing bonus uh, for using them. And that advance and signing bonus will be higher the more tickets you sell per year because you know those lovely service fees that everybody loves paying on tickets? Well, that's how those ticketing companies make money, right? And the more they make in service fees, um, the more valuable you are to them as a client and the higher your uh, advance or your uh, signing bonus is going to be. And those ticketing deals can last anywhere from one to four years. Um, you know, ideally for you as a promoter, you want to have a smaller deal, higher advance, right? Or higher signing bonus, but you're not going to get a signing bonus when you haven't done any shows yet. Don't have a track record. Um, some, and, and one more thing you can add as an additional revenue stream for you, if you have your own ticketing deal, right? So that's why you want to ideally work with a venue that allows you to sell your own tickets is those, those lovely fees that <laughs> customers love to pay. Um, there is something calculated into there or added into there um, called a promoter rebate. And those promoter rebates are money that the promoter gets per ticket sold, right? So let's say you have a dollar rebate and you can set those based on ticket price. So let's say your rebate is a dollar minimum. At a $15 ticket, it jumps up to $1.50. At a $25 ticket, it jumps up to $2, right? You can set the scale. A lot of times a ticketing company has to approve whatever scale you, you negotiate and you're going to have more leverage on that. Again, the more shows you do and the more higher priced shows you do. Um, but imagine you're getting a, a, as high as a $5 per ticket rebate or an $8 per ticket rebate and you sell a thousand tickets. That's five to $8,000 just on rebates that you're bringing in um, on as revenue, right? So that's another great ancillary revenue stream for outside promoters, which is why I say you want to try to control the tickets and sell your own tickets. If the venue is insistent on it, the biggest value to you is one trying to share in that rebate that the venue gets. Uh, if the venue doesn't get rebates, then maybe something where you can help the venue. You can be almost like a uh, you know a consultant or give them some advice on, hey, you can actually get rebates and make some extra money on these tickets you sell. Um, and then the other thing you definitely want is the mailing list, right? Whenever someone buys a ticket, that's another value you can build as a promoter is building that email list. Um, so that's super, super important for your longevity as a promoter. Some quick platforms is, is TicketWeb, Eventbrite, Hold My Ticket, eTix, and Access. Those are some very popular ticketing platforms uh, that people use. Take a look at all of them. Look at what the rates are. Reach out to them. So what kind of deal they're willing to offer you as a first-time deal. See if you can get a first-time deal 
down to a year. If you can get a one year first time deal, that'd be a really, really great place to start. And then um, the last tip, I guess a little redundant with tip four, but just keep always be super professional, right? Dealing with, with venues and club owners uh, can sometimes be challenging. I mean, you're dealing with all kinds of different personalities. Sometimes you'll have people that are drinking uh, all day long. Sometimes you'll have people that are taking drugs and um, you have all different levels of of, of education, whether that's formal education, going to college or just street smarts or um, different levels of just how people deal with others. Um, so some are going to be super professional and really friendly. Some are going to be a little crazy and nutty. Some, nutty, some of them you have to chase down for, for your money, right? Um, but regardless of what scenario it is when you're first starting out, just be patient, roll with the punches, uh, always kill with kindness, even when people are rude and unprofessional. Try to always be be nice and kind, be professional, be organized, and you're always going to stand out above the other promoters when you're doing things the right way, the legit way, you're doing it in writing, you have backup to everything. And, you know, it might drive some venues crazy if you're uh, the super organized person, but they're gonna wanna work with you because they, they're gonna learn a lot from you even if they don't admit it. But there's some quick tips in, in dealing with venues and getting started. Um, for the next video, feel free to reach out. Let me know if you guys have any questions in the comments. As we mentioned, Shannon asked the questions in the comments last week, and I thought this would be a really great video. There's some definitely some other areas we can go with with these quick tips that I'm doing every week. Uh, and this is a little bit more than a quick tip. And then I also want to encourage you guys, we do have a Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash making it academy, where we have over 20 courses, depending on when you watch this, right? As of the release of this video, there's 24 courses there right now um, that are anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and a half where we take deep dives into digital marketing, how to build audiences, how to build a business. These are great for promoters, artist managers, artists, you know, people want to be booking agents, agents, uh, anyone in that touring or digital marketing space. Uh, we talk about customer funnels, sales funnels, how to set up email campaigns, all kinds of really, really cool stuff. Uh, and then we also, and it's $10 a month. And for, for 20 bucks a month, we do monthly workshops where it's more of a deep dive into, um, all of the different people that are part of, of the Academy where we have a chance to talk in person, not in person, but on, you know, virtually on zoom and we're take a deep dive working through different problems and challenges that people are working through. It's almost like a con group consulting uh, session, but uh, sometimes only one person shows up and it's almost like a free one-on-one -on -one session. And then if you're watching this video, I'll throw in a free one-on-one -on -one if you sign up when the next uh, 48 hours of the release of this video, um, and we'll do a one-on-one and we'll get to know your, your story, your journey of the industry, see what you want to learn and uh, it'll help us tailor those those workshops as well, um, making sure we're tailoring it, tailoring it to all the, the students that are part of the academy. So thank you all so much for watching. I know this, this YouTube stuff, I'm supposed to tell you to subscribe in the beginning of the video. Please subscribe to the channel, leave a comment and until next time, spread love, positivity and kindness in the world and go see shows, meet people, make stuff. Peace everyone. <laughs> Live the life you love.